p.m. Everyone, we would like to introduce you to our wonderful and amazing EdTech coordinator, Tanya Mills, and she will be talking to you about the awesome possibilities that you can do with 3D printers and 3D printing. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, Leo, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, and Alyssa, you want to introduce yourself too? My name is Annalisa Spicer, and I have been with the district for 13 years, serving as a librarian, but 19 years as an educator teaching high school English. So I'm excited to be here working with these people. I'm Lisa Salvo Moreno, uh, go by Leo. Um, been with the district about uh, 18 years, 16 years as an educator, two years as a librarian, and now I'm doing this as a, uh, starting off as a spe specialist. Okay. And my name is Tanya Mills. I've been with the district SEISD for around 26 years. So I have um, mainly spent most of my time uh, first as a middle school computer information system teachers or computer lit for about seven. And then uh, the rest of the time is at the district level, either developing curriculum or doing some other type of uh, PD development when it comes to integrating technology within the classroom with your teachers and with the students. I'm going to start off with the actual presentation here on the screen. Let me go to presentation mode. If at any time that you guys have any questions or any comments that you need to make, please let us know. Uh, the size of the class is a little bit small, but that's cool because I'm glad that you guys are here. And that means that you probably have that personal one to one so that you can ask questions and we can have a conversation about the content that we're going to share. So I welcome you to the Ready Tech Go conference. I think this is our fourth, fifth year, seventh. <laughs> I think it's probably about four or five years that we've done this. Um, and hopefully you guys will be back to join us for next year, which will probably be either a version of the virtual one we have, or maybe hybrid or in person. I'm hoping in person, be able to see your faces. So this is a little bit about us, about our vision, the goals, and the pathways that we try to set within our district. Um, since you have a copy of the presentation, please feel free to review the following slide. One of the things that we really want to make sure that we emphasize is that we're going to try to build teacher capacity in technology applications through our professional development future ready pathways and the conferences that we actually offer to our teachers and also those throughout the state of Texas. So this class is about 3D printing in the K-5 classroom. Um, this is something that's kind of near and dear to me. I spend most of my time either teaching others on how to use 3D printers or going through the process of building items to print out on the 3D printers I have at home. As mentioned before, in order to make this a successful participation or class, um, make sure that you join me with interaction. If you have any questions, suggestions, if you want to reflect on something, let me know. If there is something that I'm going to have you guys go out and do on your devices, I usually say eyes and zoom. And that's a way for you to know that you need to come back to our main window. And in fact, I should have changed that to Teams since we're using Teams today. If you need to take notes, please feel free to do so. And if you have any questions that are unrelated to the topic, um, please wait until the end of the session itself, okay? The session that we're interacting with right now um, has many T-Test and ISTE standards that relate to it. Uh, this one is to inspire students to, to positively contribute to and responsibly participate in the digital world. And the T-test that it maps to is planning. It also relates to our technology application, TEKS, and the TEKS for science in ELAR. The one that I forgot to put in here is the one that actually relates to math too, because a lot of the things that we do within the 3D printing realm relates also to coding. So that's part of the piece that also needs to be included in this. 
So what we will do today is learn about 3D printing and the steps that it takes to print an object from actually creating it to having it come out on the 3D printer. We are going to have the opportunity to actually design something in Doodle, which is a online, um, it's not really a AutoCAD full course, but it is an opportunity for the students to understand the principles behind 3D printing. We're gonna discuss the process of designing a 3D lesson for the classroom, and we will view and participate in a Tinkercad classroom project. So all of those items we will do within two hours that you're here with me. So far, are there any questions from anyone concerning the content for today? Okay. So I'm gonna give you a few moments to go ahead and read through this right here so that we can all probably be on the same level page when it comes to why and that's the big question. Why do we want to do this with our kids? Why do we want to invest the money that goes into 3D printing? And why do we think it is something that is necessary for our students to experience, especially in the K-5 classroom? So I will be quiet for a moment and have you read this information here. Okay, would anyone like to go ahead and chime in with a, huh, that's interesting in regards to what you've just read on the screen? Or do you find any of it interesting? We'll go ahead and pick someone at random in the next few moments. Leo, what did you think about the statement? Uh, I really like um, that we're, we're still, um, I don't know, I don't know how to put it in words, but math has always been, when, when I've looked at results in math, it's always been the bottom uh, or scoring for the students, so I like that nationally we're trying we're putting math on top um, but i like also it's not just something that's rote memory that it's also being integrated into different in the different fields like science technology and engineering okay thank you for that and also if you want to reply too but you don't want to unmute or you please feel free to go ahead and type in your thoughts into the chat. We'll make sure that we keep our eye on that so that we can go ahead and share that information with others too. So in the mindset of how we're starting off with this, um, a lot of this actually ties back to STEM and STEAM. So that's one selling point that you can do if you choose to kind of bring this back to your district or to your campus and convince others to join you. Okay, so as we go through and take a look at the information we have here, there's math, there's engineering, there's science, there's technology, all of that I will convince you is part of being a person who designs through AutoCAD programming and prints that item out on a 3D printer. All those things are relatable. And now that I said that, I now have to prove it, right? Okay. I did see someone unmute themselves. Did you have a question? I don't know if she's trying to say something or if it's not coming through. Okay. So the first thing is the why. Why do we want to do 3D printing with our students? When we have our STEM STEAM days that we go out into the campuses and we share drones, coding, stop motion, um, animation, um, and also 3D printing with our kids, we want to kind of hook them into the possibilities. So the first question we ask is, what item do you see here on the screen do you believe is 3D printed? 
even though I have the video embedded in there that tells you what it is. But ignore the video and look at the picture. If you could type into the chat, which one of those items, objects, do you believe has been 3D printed for that movie? Ah, the shell necklace. Yes. The headpiece. Yes. What else? The hat. Uh huh. The item that you see that overlays her costume itself. Sounds great. Uh huh. So those items are 3D printed. And the reason behind that is mostly cost. So if you are doing a movie, you have actors who need to be on the stage, they need to be filmed. If the item that she's wearing is lost or damaged, you don't have the time to go to the person who's created it, who wove it with bamboo and have them do another 17. Um, plus it's also cost prohibitive. It's gonna cost you a lot. Instead, if the object itself is 3D printed, this could probably be done in less than 24 hours. And you can have 7,000 of them just lying in the trailer somewhere for someone to go out and bring on stage so she can go ahead and swap out whatever with the new one, okay? So not only the hat, but the overlay that she has for her dress, I could probably tell you that this shell that's around her neck, those could be 3D printed now. Even the clothing itself can be 3D printed. So there's a lot of opportunities there for design with things that usually took years and years to actually learn how to. Now you can kind of do within an afternoon or so if you have the proper you know, file that's been loaned to you or enhance what you actually have on hand. Okay. So now that you have the actual presentation, please feel free to go ahead and watch the video. It's fascinating. That's fascinating. But I'm gonna go ahead and skip because I really wanna have probably about 30 minutes of me talking and the majority of the time of you guys doing something, okay? This is the STEM, STEAM, and practice. One of the things that we use within our district to kind of explore exactly where a campus or classroom is on the scale. The hope is to get all of our campuses to the full immersion when it comes to using STEM and STEAM experiences. And probably where you'll start off first is the exploration where you'll have somebody come in and probably spend a day with you or a day with the kids, showing them the possibilities of what STEM, STEAM can be. The programming, the robots, the drones, the 3D printing. So as you move along the scale, it becomes something that's not just something we do on Friday, it becomes something that we do each and every day because it does relate to the science, the math, the English, reading and language arts, all of those things are part of what makes STEM STEAM. So I would like for you guys to be able to have this. So that's part of the conversation that you can start with those at the campus level or with your principal or even at your district level so that they know that it's not just something that's a flash in a pan. It is something that actually becomes fully immersed in what everyone does each and every day. Questions about the STEM STEAM in practice? Okay. So one of the things that we do with 3D printing is that we use what is called a computer aided design software. And the one that we will use today is called Tinkercad. This will benefit our students once they start to use these programs when it comes to spatial intelligence, engineering and design, creativity. It also teaches them how to manage their files. Um, one of the big hangups that we had uh, when we introduced this to the classroom is that the students actually create their product on their iPad because that's what we use for our pre-K kinder all the way to second. And they can do the same on Chromebooks but they have to know and understand the process of what to do with it to get it from the actual device itself 
into the hands of the teacher. So that's a very important part that students have to understand. This right here is spatial intelligence. Um, there is a link that apparently I took off, which I will put back. So that link gives the kids the opportunity to understand exactly the difference between 2D and 3D objects. If you look at the example that's in the lower right hand corner, which one of these A, B, C, and D is actually shown on the left hand side? I'm going to give you a few moments to think about that. And if you know the answer to that, please type that into the chat. A, B, C, or D. And I kind of remember doing this in college, I think. It's one of the things that we did for a test or something. Ah, I have someone who said A. I have someone else who said D. Ah, conflict. I like this. I have a person who said D. And the answer is actually D. So if you look at the top, you have the two triangles that meet. And then if you look to the left or the right, you'll see that you have a triangle that actually points to the right. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So I'm going to put the link back into this slide here because there's a, a presentation that has like 30 of these things. And it's something that you can share with your kids because they have to detach themselves from that 2D environment and try to elevate the way that they think to a 3D mindset. And I can tell you that a lot of our kids can do this. And can someone tell me how we know? that our students are able to transform from the 2D to the 3D mindset easily. Starts with a V, has a G in the second word, and a D, E, O. Video games, thank you. So if you ever seen a child take an iPad and immerse themselves in a 3D environment on a video game, meaning they're able to actually not get dizzy and sick as the object moves randomly on the actual screen, then it's very easy for them to do the same when it comes to understanding how to design something in 2D to 3D. I've seen kids who have uh, no hesitation in doing Minecraft. It's very easy for them to adapt to that. I've seen adults who try to do it and they just can't get it. You just can't detach yourself so that you're in that 3D environment. And we'll probably take a look at that in a few moments once we do Tinkercad. And there are a lot of careers that are happening inside of the 3D printing environment in AutoCAD. Um, there's a lot of ways for our students to take that gift, that natural ability that they have, that many of us don't, to actually make a living and enjoy what they do such as developing products, maybe even developing houses and architecture, not the traditional way where you have brick and mortar, but you actually have 3D printers that are large enough to actually build houses. Uh, there's military, military aspects of doing that too. Um, there's medical aspects. If we get to the point where you can actually have people 3D printing lungs or other items that are um, needed, instead of having to wait for um, other organs to come another way. This video right here, and I don't know if it's going to play with my audio. Can you hear it? No, we're not able to hear it. I'm not hearing anything. OK, so basically what he's talking about <laughs> is the fact that he's going through the process of what 3D printing is called additive manufacturing, where you actually add a layer on top of another layer in order to make an object. So there's a lot of things that you can do as far as using filament to do this. 
And there's also other ways that you can do it with the laser cutting, where you remove the actual um, material in order to make something else. And we might actually revisit that. So there's a many sites that are out there that actually have pre-made items already for you to use. And there is a lot of different printers and filaments for you to choose from in order to bring those into your classroom. So if you see right here, you can kind of see the actual filament being squeezed out, heated, and then placed on top of each other in order to make the object itself. One of the things that you'll have to make sure that your students understand is that a 3D printer does not create an object in less than five minutes if it's really complex. If it is a complex item, such as something like this, or maybe even that headdress that she was wearing, it's going to take time to do it. It will take time. So what a lot of people end up doing is that you have the kids design what they want, and then you have the 3D printer printed overnight so that when you come back in the morning, hopefully you have something that you can go ahead and share unless something goes wrong. And then when you show up in the morning, you have a big ball of filament. <laughs> so either way, it's really easy for you to go ahead and get a routine so that you can generate and create a lot of things and have the students excited about seeing it show up the next day. Patience is also a virtue. So I am going to go and skip this and show you this process here. The steps themselves are pretty much routine for each and every printer that we have. And it's also something that the students will need to understand so they can see there is work that is done in order to create that item. First thing is, is that you spend a lot of time hoping that you can get them to understand the ideal of what happens. We want to remove the student from going to Thingiverse and getting something that someone else made and then printing it as their own. What you want to do instead is give them the opportunity to see what the possibilities are, but get them to make that object to the best of their ability. Then once you have that ideal, you design it in a 3D model program, the CAD software. The 3D model program will then make an STL file, which is then shared with a slicing program. And that slicing program usually is something that is associated with the printer itself. And that gives the slicing program the ability to kind of slice pieces and G-code and then share it. So you're going to transfer that model to the 3D printer. You're going to choose the filament that you want to use in order for that item to come out the color that you want it to be. Um, one of the big things that we had to stress for the kids at one of our schools is the filament you see is the color the object will be. <laughs> I know you want the object to be green, blue, black, and navy because you drew it on paper, and that's how you designed it in the AutoCAD program. But when we send it to the printer, many of our printers only have one filament option, which means that's the color the object will be when it comes out. And they get disappointed, but that's okay because you can do other things with that object and I'll show that to you in a moment. Once the object is printed and when a printer stops, that's when you remove it from the print bed and then you hand it to the child and then the process will start all over again. So now that I've said this, how many of you here have actually done this before? You already have a 3D printer and you have had students design and print their items. Okay, I have someone who's typing. Ah, high five, awesome. Uh, Peggy, do you want to uh, mute yourself just for a moment and tell us the really short the experience you've had with 3D printing in your classroom? Um, sure. I'm a gifted and talented teacher, and I um, teach my kiddos typically in about second grade for the first time um, to just begin using Tinkercad and start to design 
Um, and we've done all kinds of things from, we made um, snow globes one year and we created buildings and things to go inside a glass jar as a snow globe. We've done Christmas ornaments, we've done Fiesta medals, um, but I'm here because I'm always looking for new ideas. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for sharing. Uh, would anyone else like to share real quick? Okay. So we're just gonna, Leo, did you wanna share? Because you've done Oh yeah, I was gonna say that. Yes, yeah, so in the library, I didn't use Tinkercad, we used Doodle 3D. And so uh, we, we had kids uh, design their own keychains. And, um, and then, so we had maker, maker bots that we got grant from the San Antonio ISD Foundation. And so uh, we got another one and then our uh, CTE teacher actually had them do the more advanced program and they were putting out some really cool models up there. Fantastic, fantastic. Oh, and I see that someone actually designed and printed out kindness coins. I think that is a very great way to go ahead and use that resource. Um, it gives the students the ability to kind of understand and reflect that when you offer something to someone else selfishly, then it makes it a great day for that person because they received it. So kindness coins. Um, Janet, did you wanna talk a little bit about that? Well, I, um, I had the kids take a look at um, the signs that were already um, made. And then we talked about kindness coins. We designed them on paper. And um, then they, they used uh, Google Drawings to start with. Um, they did the text. I wanted them to have a little bit of text in there. They got a, a chance to play around with how to make it go in a circle or around a shape or to add a shape to it. Um, and then we did use uh, Tinkercad and, you know, they, they were able to save the files and everything. The hardest part was me trying to manage this for the whole school. It, uh. it was a whole school um, adventure. And it was quite an adventure because then I have all of these files that I have to take a look at. But I actually took the kids through the whole thing. I had them actually drive and go in with my laptop and use, you know, the software go in and, and, and slice it and see what the next process was, send it to the printer, you know, and we had the ones that were needing some tweaking, you know, they weren't mm -hmm. quick enough and they weren't printing correctly, but it was all a learning process. Um, right. So it, it was a it was a lot. I could have used some help, um, you know, because it was just way too many to try to print. But but they enjoyed it and I enjoyed it and we learned a lot. Both both of us learned a lot. Okay. Myself included. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, when it comes to mass production, it does take a lot, especially if your classroom or your library only has two printers, or maybe even one printer that may not be working at that time. So when someone gives an order of needing to have 500 of those things, then yes, it does cause that little bit of a bottleneck as to exactly how do I get that done. Um, that probably is a conversation that we'll have in a little bit because I think there is a solution that we can make, but it does take the opportunity to kind of understand exactly is that item we're making either a trinket or something that's essential. So we will talk about that in a moment. There are several different kinds of 3D printers. I know that you guys probably have ones that might be the favorite or ones that came along with what you did as far as ordering that with the actual uh, grant that you might have received. I prefer for myself and the two that I have at home are the ones that are actually enclosed. And the reason why I like that is because I have a cat who apparently has a death wish. So every time I print, she wants to go into the printer because it happens to be warm. That's not good. So I have the ability to go ahead and close that door. So if you do have youngers who might be curious, then you might want to have the enclosed version. If you have olders who want to print things that are bigger with more space or volume, then you probably want to go with the ones that are not restricted by the actual size on the width and also the height to a certain degree. So 
So I'm going to show you a classroom. This is not mine. It actually belonged to Kat Sauter, who was our STEM STEAM um, coordinator for the district. And you can see that you can make within your classroom a haven for students to go, meaning they have computers that are there accessible that allows them to design. And then you just look to your right and then you can go ahead and print. She also had the kids go through and build 3D printers. And I think that's fascinating because that gets them out of the mindset of being a consumer. I go, I point, I pay, I get. Instead, I build. I build, I design. If it happens not to work, then I reconsider what I did. I go back, I redesign, and I try again. So this is a wonderful opportunity for our K-5 kids to design items for others. Um, you can imagine that over on the side, you have that little boy. What they did is the pre-K kinder requested certain items to be printed so they would have them outside on their uh, activity wall. If you ever gone down a pre-K kinder hallway, uh, you'll see that they have things there for the kids to touch and move and uh, it's just a wonderful experience for them. So the kids worked with the older kids, asked for certain things. The other older kids designed those items, printed those items, and then gave that to the pre-K kinders. So right there, you're building those relationships with the kids who are actually in the class designing and building the items. So that leads us into what is called uh, design thinking, where we need to make sure that we adhere to a simple framework for designing. So that way it's easy for our kids to kind of understand exactly what the purpose is behind doing this. And I'm looking down at my watch and apparently I need to move faster. So there's Phil, the journey begins with empathy, um, using the information from the person who's requesting as a guide, imagine, brainstorm solutions, working with others is a great opportunity for kids to 3D print together instead of isolation. You build something as a team, it fails, then as a team you discuss exactly what you could have done to make it better. So we want to relate that to real world experiences um, to make sure that you are doing a project that relates to or is tied to the curriculum. Remember, yet you want to keep it simple, not something that's overly complicated. Work with others on your grade level or in your subject area to kind of come up with how does this tie to what we're doing today, tomorrow, or next week. So if you have a reading teacher who's going to go ahead and have the kids read a book about a mouse and a frog, then maybe the students who are doing the 3D printing project would design the mouse and the frog and Lego-like because kids love Legos. So that ties directly into the curriculum. So you need to make sure that you go over the design process for your core subject area, um, spiral the project work into the core instruction, designate time to teach 3D printing or to printing skills. And then since it may be that you may not have a lot of printers available to you, you wanna kind of stagger this so that it's not overwhelming the printer to be printing everything each and every day. So maybe it's a nine week period or maybe it's a two week turnaround. And in the presentation are some project ideals for you to think about related to math, science, the humanities, engineering, and such. And this is where I wanted to land on a little bit earlier, but it's something common that we as teachers or educators have to consider. When we have that 3D printer in our classroom or on our campus, are we using it with a purpose or are we just creating what are called trinkets? Does that make sense? 
So mass printing out objects just to hand out without a purpose behind it is more of a trinket type thing. But if you do have a lot of these objects that need to be printed, then maybe there's a possibility of staggering it so that you're not so overwhelmed to get these done. So going back to the empathy coins, and there's other things too that can be seen the same way. Instead of having the entire sixth grade do this, then maybe we have the sixth grade in one class do the 3D printing, and then the empathy coins and the other sixth grade class are made out of some kind of clay that's dried overnight. Or it may be some other type of tangible object or material that the kids can use to do pretty much the same type of design process, but doesn't always rely on it to be a 3D printed item. Does that make sense? I can't tell you how much paper mache I've gone through so much, but it's something that actually lends itself to building and designing the same thing. Hands on, oh good, yes. I am going to drop this in the chat. And because it does rely that you're using your computer to do this, you may not see me, but hopefully you will be able to hear my relaxing voice as I guide you through the process of using what is called doodle3d.com. Is there anyone here who's actually used this before? I think I heard someone mention it. Okay. So this usually is the first step that we take when we introduce the concept of 3D printing to the students. Um, when they see that printer, the first thing they wanna do is, I wanna get in there, miss, I need to make something. And I say, I admire that, but I want you to show me what you can do in this one first, okay? So if you take a look at the actual screen, you'll see that you have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. On the left-hand side is the 2D version of what you're gonna do. On the right-hand side is the 3D version of what you're gonna do. I would like for you to go down to the very bottom of the screen and find the star. Go down to the bottom of the screen and find the star. When you click on the star, I want you to go ahead and pick a shape. Any shape you want. Now you can also stay with me on this side with what I'm doing and just watch, or you can kind of go off on your own. It's entirely up to you. So as we click on these objects, you can see that it actually gives a scale of millimeters also very important for our students to understand. They may not be there yet, but we want them to be conscious of size. The first thing a child does, an adult does, even myself, is when I design something, I want it to be grand. I want it to be so big that people are going to be seriously surprised and a little bit scared about what they see but that's not something we can print out all the time on our printers because we might have finite resources such as the filament. So they may have to understand that the size of the object that you're printing is gonna be a little bit smaller than what you think, but that's okay. So the object that you've drawn, I would like for you to go ahead and fill in with color. And the way that you do that is you go down to the very bottom and you look for the bucket. And in the middle, you're going to see the, um, the drop of color. And I'll give you a chance to go ahead and fill it in. And let me do one more. And once you fill the object in, the last thing I would like for you to do is to click on the text and type. Type something in. And I can tell you that when we start, I have so many objects that have mom and dad on it, which is awesome, because they love to take these home and share that with their parents. 
So if you can come back to my window, if you would, just for a moment, it's the tab that's at the very top. And let me explain real quick exactly what this designed purpose is as an exercise. So go ahead and show you that you can combine several objects and layer them on top of each other. And that you can use the text to go ahead and cut into the actual object itself. So when done properly, that means that when this object prints out, then you will have a hollow or absent area that would be the mom. Okay, does that make sense? So if we look at that object, can you tell me if I were to 3D print this, what are two or three of the characteristics that you would see once the object was done? In other words, is it going to be purple, orange, and red? The answer would be no. <laughs> because it's the color of the filament, right? It's all going to be one color. So that's one of the things that you'll have to tell your kids about. Second, look at mom. What's going to be the problem with mom? It's hollow. It's hollow. And the O has nothing yeah, to grab o. onto, right? Mm -hmm. So if we print this out and I take it off the build plate, what's going to happen to the center part where the O is? Fall out. It's going to be left behind. It's going to fall out, right? So one of the things that you want to show the kids is anything that's isolated and by itself needs to be attached. So we draw another little baby triangle. And we move it over so it kind of grabs onto those sides. And then we fill it in with color. <gasps> That's horrible. And there. You gonna do it? Do it. Now that I'm in front of a lot of people, now you don't want to behave yourself. Imagine as it, if it did do that. Switch over to your um, version of Doodle 3D. Spend just a few moments going in and moving things around, using the eraser, using the object that allows you to go ahead and draw. I could have just drawn that object. I am so smart. Okay. Make sure you understand how to delete. Click and select. And take a look at the tools that happen to be on the right hand side. I'm going to give you probably about another three minutes or so. And then we'll talk about what an STL happens to be. Okay, let's have you guys come back to the actual window itself. And as you come back to the actual window, I want to make sure that I point this out on the slide deck. In the lower left hand corner is the intro video to how to use Doodle 3D. It's a very sophisticated program. Um, you can do things that are simple and you can move those up to things that happen to be complex. I'm going to go back to the actual program itself to make sure I point out the following items. Uh, there is the undo that's here. There's also the ability for you to do a new one or to save what you currently have. 
as you go through the process of having your kids do these items, please take the opportunity to actually talk about naming conventions. And with naming conventions, you are sharing with the students that certain objects, if they belong to you, should have your name in it. If that doesn't happen, what ends up happening on your computer or on the flash drive that you're using to take these and move them to the actual 3D printer and the slicing program is that you'll end up with Doodle 1, Doodle 2, Doodle 3, Doodle 752, and it makes it very hard to kind of manage who does this belong to and how can I give that back to the kid? So make a game at it if you need to, but teach your students how to do naming conventions. Does that make sense? It's probably one of the biggest things that we had to actually work on. So it could be first name, could be your email address, whatever it happens to be, make sure that you type that in here when you save your objects to share with the teacher. On the upper right hand corner is another object, it's an arrow, and this allows you to go ahead and choose the actual um, file type. Uh, we mainly deal with STLs, um, and the reason with that is I'm going to show you the process that I usually follow when we use the Doodle 3D with the kids, okay? So the STL is going to be saved to my computer, will be saved to their device or saved to whatever you want to have as their drive. There's also an object, G code, you can back it up as a zip. I'm going to go ahead and download the Doodle. And I'm going to move to the next slide in the presentation, which is the intermediate part. Many of you have mentioned that you have used Tinkercad before in the past. So when having the students do their Doodle 3Ds, I usually have them put it into their Tinkercad project. And the reason why I do that is gives me the opportunity as a teacher to inspect and also fix objects that are not going to print well. OK, it may be that the student has forgotten to put that line that has the uh, ability to hold that O together, or whatever the letter happens to be. I can have the student fix it if that's part of the engineering process that I want them to learn about, that the object that you're gonna print is going to fail. So what do I have to do in order to make it succeed? Or if I happen to be pressed for time, if I bring it into Tinkercad, then I can fix it myself as a teacher because I have access to all of my students' projects inside the classroom, and then I can print it out. And then I can go on with my life and go home at 4.30 on a Friday, which is awesome. So we're gonna go into Tinkercad. So I do wanna spend some time in here for those of you who have or have not created accounts first, or if you have not created classrooms. So before I transition to that, does anyone have any questions about Doodle 3D? Are you guys planning to use it today? <laughs> yeah. You and are? No question. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't have a printer anymore. OK. <laughs> well, I would say that if you want to make sure that you kind of amaze your family with gifts that are personalized, Doodle 3D is the way to do it. OK, um, let's see. I would like for you all to, and I'm going to log out. If we leave today with anything, I want you all to have your own Tinkercad accounts. Uh, how many people do not have a Tinkercad account yet? Ah, OK. Ah, okay, I have a couple of people who don't. So I'm gonna walk you through the process right here and make sure that you guys have at least that Tinkercad educator account created, okay? So if you go to tinkercad.com, which is a Autodesk program, this one is free for educators. 
So I just paste, I pasted the doodle thing back in there. So this is free for educators. It has a lot of new capabilities. In fact, they added two things that I hadn't seen before. Not only can you design in 3D, like you see this here, you can also do circuitry. So if you want your kids to understand electricity, how it flows, what capacitors are, where transitions are, what buttons are, what LEDs are, if you don't have that makeup to do that physically and within your classroom, then this is a way that you can actually do it on screen and then show the students how that works. It's very handy when you start to introduce them to robotics because many of the robotics that we have out there, the kits, are not ones that actually expose circuitry. Everything is housed inside of a hard shell for safety. But there are also robots out there that are transparent. So you can kind of see the innards inside to understand that it's not magical. It's all based upon electronics. So that's a great way to show the, stu the students that first step. Engineering is a fascinating world. And then at the very bottom, you have what is called the coding foundation. So this gives these students the ability to actually do Blockly code and have it design a 3D object through coding. All of these objects or items are available for you to use inside of Tinkercad. I usually stay here with the 3D design, but I am not afraid to branch out to the other two, okay? So let us get you all signed in by having you click on sign up if you have not signed up before, and then have you choose educators start here. Okay, this is a safe space. Make sure you're a teacher and I certify that I am and I agree. And then I choose either one of the ones that you use within your district to kind of log you into your accounts. In our district, we use Google, okay? Once you click on Google, it should already know I exist, so it's gonna kick me in my classroom. It will have you go do through, go through a couple other steps to kind of define exactly what your profile is. I'm gonna give you a few moments to do that. If you already have a Tinkercad account, go ahead and sign into that account, please. Okay. Is there anyone who is stuck, needs assistance? Is everyone okay? Thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. So my assumption is, is that you already have or you're getting into your new Tinkercad account. If you are getting into your new Tinkercad account, I know that you're not able to see my screen because you're occupied. I'm going to spend just a few moments here kind of going over what project done within the district. And that is creating the IT mascot. Okay. Will we uh, need to wait for another person or are we okay? Okay, so I'm going to have you guys come back to my screen so you can go ahead and see what we have here. Um, it's going to take me just a couple minutes, but I want to make sure that we have that connection between, once again, that 2D object that we're creating and the 3D product that's done at the very end. So uh, we have a mascot for our IT department. His name is, it's not Carl, is it? They've changed the name on me. Uh, this That robot guy, <laughs> it has changed. But we had one of our um, 
designers in IT, she actually drew it out. And what they wanted to do is to have this as a 3D object to go ahead and hand out to kids and hand out to teachers who accomplish things uh, as far as technology. So I received the actual drawing and she was kind enough to go ahead and give me that 360 view. So it makes it easier to design it if you're able to take that look at what it looks at the front top, back, bottom, left, right, 3D, uh, 360. And once I had that, I went into Tinkercad. So I built the object itself inside Tinkercad as close as I could to the actual shape. And it's by using those um, primitive objects and some of the other advanced shapes that they have within there. So once the object was created, at least the foundation of it, I then went into a program that I have on my iPad that's called Nomad Sculpt. And when I actually purchased it, it was probably about $10. So I went back and I looked at it and it's not that anymore. Apparently people like it. So the price went up, but there are other programs that will let you do this on an iPad. And that's just going back into it and kind of refining the details that Tinkercad could not do. Once that's finished, I sent it to uh, the MakerBot that we have within the office. It's tilted on an angle making it easier not to have all the supports that it needs to hold it up. And that way it doesn't actually mess up the uh, finish that you have on the object when it's finished. And here they are. The beauty about a 3D printer is that I can make things as small as possible and then as big as I want to. And all of them basically look the same. So, when it comes to mass production of certain objects that you might have to do within your classrooms, it may be better suited just to make them tinier in some cases. Okay, so that way you can get more done as far as the product itself. Questions about this process right here. Oh, awesome. Thank you. So it may be that first step that you take with your students once they become familiar with the actual printing process, the creation process, is that maybe you make a mascot for your classroom. And the best designed mascot is the one that's actually printed out. And then you make several small copies. And then when students get a reward for either behavior or accomplishment, then what you get is one of these. And that kind of gets them excited because next semester, I want somebody else to design what we're going to use as the reward. And it might be you because you have that design uh, brilliancy that comes through. I need to come over here. All right, so I'm gonna leave off on the coding one because I really want us to spend some time inside the actual classroom environment. What I would need is for someone who wants to volunteer to let us share their screen. So I already have my stuff set up. So anyone who would want to volunteer. I'm looking at someone now. No, I'm kidding. Anybody else? That means you would have to unmute yourself and then share your screen. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And anyone? Bueller? Who's okay. Gonna yeah. Who's going to be the brave one? I, oh, it doesn't let me share. It says only organizers and presenters can share. What? Really? Yeah. Oh, no. That's probably a setting I have to change, right? I just added you as a presenter. Oh, you did. Okay. 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 I can share now. Go for it. What am I sharing? Your screen. <laughs> Which screen? Your screen. Yeah, Which one? I have so many open. Uh, one with Tinkercad, the one that has right? your Tinkercad on it. 
Thank you. And I should have told you guys ahead of time of my expectations. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, your screen right. is tiny. Ah, it's better. Small? Okay. Okay. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this, I'm going to have him go through something, pause, and then let you go ahead and see it on your own screen. So please keep your Tinkercad open. Keep your Tinkercad open. Okay. First thing I want to do is go ahead and take a look over on the left hand side. And here you have your link that will let you open up your classes, your designs, and also take a look at the tutorials. I cannot emphasize enough, and I know it's something that pulling teeth. Your students must have the opportunity to go through the tutorials for this program. If they do not go through the tutorials, a guided practice that would lead to frustration. Um, I've done this before with first graders, and the first time they can't move an object like they seen me do on the screen they're just uh, i can't i don't know it has to be the tutorials that give them that foundation of design okay so please make sure the students go through and do the tutorials all right i would like for uh leo to go to designs and leo you've used this before right the program um yes I went through ah. one training. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's how far I got. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're just going to do something simple. So we're not going to do circuits or the code blocks. We're going to do the actual 3D printing ones. So we're going to scroll back up to the top. And then we're going to see the object of create. Click on the plus sign. And choose 3D design. Okay. So everybody else. Go ahead and switch back over to your own account that you hopefully had the opportunity to create and do the same steps that we're doing right here with Leo. Just we're going to design and then we're choosing the option to go ahead and do a 3D design. And for some reason, Tinkercad has been incredibly slow today. It's almost as if it knows that I'm trying to actually show it off <laughs> and it doesn't want to do it. Um, um, I refresh the page. Yeah, if it doesn't come back from its journey, we may have to go back into the one that you created yourself and just kind of mess around with that object. Really? Not doing anything. Wow. <laughs> so I actually created it, but it didn't complete it. If you click on Tinker This on the first object that's in that list, this the one, one that says Incredible Heller, okay. uh huh. Okay. And then click on Tinker This again. All right. So this is not good, <laughs> but All right, let's go, go back. back and let's go to, uh, we're gonna choose the option to go ahead and close this window. Go back? Yes, this is fine. Let's go ahead and just do um, the option for one of the tutorials which are already established, so there shouldn't be an issue with those opening up. These go here, I mean. Mm -hmm. So you go ahead and click on that, click on Tinker This. Let's see if it will actually open up this time. And it looks like it's having issues building. Yeah, I, okay. the Wi-Fi is not letting me in. All right, so I will do the following. So stop sharing um, which my is, yeah, I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen. And I'm going to go ahead and share mine. So what you should see here is the build a code option. But I'm going to go to Tinkercad. 
and I'm going to go ahead and log in. So if I can't get you into an actual Tinkercad workspace, I can at least talk a little bit about the option for the classrooms. Maybe if I don't watch it. Okay, I'm looking over here. Or I'm looking over there. Oh, you're a little bit slow. Okay. So as you go through the process of using this with your students, one of the benefits is, is that anything they design, whether it be on the Doodle 3D or another program, if it happens to be a viable STL file, or it actually uses a different type, let's see. There's the ability for you as a teacher to view and manage. And that's one of the great benefits is, is that this happens to be a clearinghouse for you. Um, the first time you 3D print or the student 3D prints, it's the process that's important, that they understand the concept. So whatever they come up with may not be a viable print, but they've done it. And you hand that over and you hook them. Now they want to do more. But with that, comes conditions, okay? You had the opportunity to 3D print. The object that you did last week was great, but now I want you to tweak it just a little bit, okay? I want you to tweak it and make it different so we can have that challenge as we design because that's what designers have. Designers have challenges and that's what we're gonna do with you. If we're gonna take what you have and tweak it a little bit to make it better, to make it stronger, so it doesn't break the next time we print it, okay? So then that becomes a process, an engineering process of redoing, renewing, and such as we go through and we build these items. Inside the classroom is where that helps you control and manage the products. I'm gonna click on this one right here that we did for uh, one of our campuses. And this was actually something that came off of um, working with Minecraft. The students had the ability to design inside of Minecraft, but we wanted to transition them from that enclosed 3D environment to actually producing something that they can hold that they designed themselves. Because it's a classroom that's set up, it's set so that I can, as a teacher, go in and pre-prepare objects for them to use. So what I did over the weekend is make all these little Minecraft things. I don't know what they are. I have no knowledge. All I do is just make stuff, like this pig. So, when the kids actually get into the classroom, they can choose which one of these that they want to do. And they can click on it and they can tinker. So we can see that, and this is my favorite one, is that one of the girls went in and they chose the dog and they put a flower on it. Let's see if it brings it up. Come on, it's such an awesome thing. Do it. Do it. Okay, I'm yelling at this. I should stop. But flower on a dog. Boom. When I printed it out, it failed because the flower was too delicate. But I did it anyway because it was so awesome. You can see the other ones here that the kids were doing. Um, this is the one that he apparently is a guy has a skull, loves skating, carries around a baseball bat. I don't know. He made it, printed that out for him. And this one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh, but this was cool because it's just cool. But it's the chance for that child to go into this AutoCAD environment and decide this is what I want to do within a reason. 
okay? So advantage of, if you have a classroom, pull, put in the foundation for the kids to actually get started. The foundation prevents frustration. Actually, I should put that on a t-shirt. If you put in at least enough for them to actually start, then it's easier for them to go ahead and just imagine outside of the box. So I love you, love. Okay. How many of you have actually used the activities options inside of Pink Your Cat Classroom? No? Okay. If you haven't, let me show you the process of setting one up real quick. So on the teacher dashboard, you would just choose the option of create new class. You would name it. Once you name it, it will give you a dashboard that looks like this. You have the opportunity to either share class link and if your students sign in with a Google or Microsoft or Office 365, then they're able to join based upon what that class link happens to be. If you have younger kids, like we were dealing with, uh, our kids were in first and second grade, we decided just to go through and just do generic accounts, student one, student two, student three, and then we just gave them a card with their name or the student name on it. So that way they didn't have to actually log in. They could just go straight to the actual classroom itself. So you have the ability to go ahead and add the kids in. You can manage students too. If you want someone to be removed, you can go ahead and remove them. If you wanna add multiple kids after they show up, you can go ahead and do that too. Um, it has, and you're not gonna do it, aren't you? Let me go back one. So these are the generic kids that we had. Um, these are the designs that they did. So I could see all the designs that all the students did based upon either ones they're doing individually on their own. So if they do a new design, it becomes part of the actual classroom so I can view it. Uh, there are the circuits, code blocks, and other things that are included here. And there's the option here for notifications. So if someone's working on something at home, because this is a online item uh, platform, then I can, as a teacher, see the very next day that so-and-so has done something different. Okay, this is their account. These are all the objects that they're working on. Maybe they've asked for me to go ahead and print this one out for them because it's finished. I can go in and tinker it. Come on, do it. Do it. <gasps> wow. I don't know why, but this one worked. Okay. So I can go in as a teacher and take a look at it. And I know this ice cream thing is not going to work because it fell last time. Then maybe I shore it up for them, change it just a little bit, and then give them the opportunity to pick it up and print it. Okay. Uh, let's see, I do want you all to have the experience or time to go in and actually build something real quick. So I'm going to switch back over to Leo if he would try once again to see whether or not okay. he can get this to work because it just he opened something up. Maybe it's a satellite. Maybe that's why it's not working. <laughs> I'm going to have five windows open. Maybe that's <laughs> All right, let's see this. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, provided we don't look at it. <laughs> look away. <laughs> look, look away. away. Don't look at it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Annalisa, you want to try? <laughs> Mine doesn't work. I haven't created anything. I'm going to be honest. That's OK. I'm here to guide you with helpful hints. 
encouraging your design concepts. For those of you who are actually with us, if you would like to switch back over to your Tinkercad, uh, take a look at the tutorials for a moment, or see if you can go ahead and create a design and see if yours opens up. I don't know what's going on with mine, but it just opened up another one of my designs. Hmm. Any luck with yours? Yeah, okay. Mine's still not opening. Yours is not? Mine is not working still. So. Okay. I'm going to give this probably another two minutes. Then I want to go to the Z blanks with you guys and talk about those. Um, and I think I have another item on the presentation that I think is important for you guys to know. So I'm looking at Annalisa. I'm waiting for her to give me the sign. She's not giving me a sign. <laughs> I'm checking to see if I can actually just create an activity first. <laughs> oh, no, no. Share your screen. Share. Okay. Share your screen. One second. I will try. Like ah, that. awesome. Okay, Love so it. I'm starting from scratch with absolutely nothing. So I wouldn't know where to begin. I haven't done Tinkercad in years and I did it under a different account and I don't remember the account. So Yeah, um, <clears throat> if you look at my Tinkercad account, I have things from Gosh knows how long ago. This is new, like the activities right here is new. So if you click mm -hmm. on activity 1.1, 1. 1, just the one click I on made. the actual card. Uh -huh. It will have you create a new design. And you can choose the type that you want. So if you okay. want your kids to kind of have a baseline for circuitry or a mm -hmm. baseline for coding, then that means that you get to choose that design that they're going to start with. Go ahead and click okay. on 3D design. Circle goes round. And we're hoping if not, then that's okay. That's okay. Our lovely SAISD Wi Fi. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, it was working before. I promise you all that. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and have you stop sharing then. I'm just going to do two more things aside uh, Tinkercad and move on to the Z blank. Thank you for trying. Anytime. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen again. Uh, this opened for some reason. I'm not going to push it. I'm going to let it do what it needs to do. So this is um, some of the coins that we caved out to the kids for Minecraft. All of it built inside of uh, Tinkercad. And we scaled it down small enough so that we were able to, excuse me, that we were able to get at least 10 on the actual build plate. So they're probably as big as a quarter. So if you have 10 on the, <gasps> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, if we have 10 on the build plate and it takes probably about five hours to print, then we could probably end up with at least 150 over the week. Okay. So that is a process. Um, many of the items that you see on here came from, and I think, was it Janet? had mentioned before using Google Drawings to do this? Yes, yes, we did. Okay, so if you have Google Drawings, you're able to do uh, redefined text that is better than what you'll find inside of Tinkercad in some cases. You're able to take objects outside 
that had been designed in Illustrator and make those into a SVG, import those into Tinkercad, and then use them as an object. Okay. So if you want the kids to be able to use uh, defined fonts or even draw objects easily, Google Drawings is something that you might want to consider bringing in as part of this process. The uh, Minecraft, it's not a sword, it's the other thing, that object. I really need to pay more attention to my objects in Minecraft. That item came from Thingiverse. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Thingiverse real quick. Are you guys familiar with Thingiverse? Mm -hmm. So anything you see in here with certain restrictions is easy for you to go ahead and use. Now, one of the things I want to mention is I probably would not share this with the kids. And the reason why I wouldn't is because it's like shopping. It's like shopping on Amazon. I type in Minecraft and I get all of these options that people have actually designed themselves. There's that thing. Okay. So if I have these objects that I have designed myself, who is the person who's actually learning the process of designing? Is it the student? No, because are these are pre-made. Is this something the kids can do themselves? Yes. At least, yes, they should be able to do this too. This is a matter of just putting down um, squares and then building out the object using those squares. Uh, if they want to have a creeper, which creeps me out, then they're able to go through and design this. Oh my gosh, that is really something they probably couldn't do. But look at all that texture, meaning that person has gone in and done each and every individual square to give it that 3D look. Okay, let's back away from that creeper and let's just go to the simple one. This. The kids should be able to do that too, or at least through a process of teaching them, they should be able to do that too. I only go to Thingiverse when it's something that I really need to go ahead and bring into the classroom to show the design process of how to build one that might be missing. And then I get distracted and such. If you have not visited Thingiverse, I'm going to take and put the link in the chat. I shared the link, Tanya. Ah, thank you. And just go ahead and take a look around. I would recommend to go ahead and create an account. So where you have sign up. Go ahead and sign up for an account because I want to show you how it ties directly to our printer. Yes, it can be very distracting for the students. Once they, ooh, okay, squirrel. That's the Mandalorian ship. Are you kidding me? That's it. Three. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, I'm already gone. Yeah, we can use it as a resource for the students or for the teachers, but eventually you want them to graduate to seeing the possibilities here. I mean, just amazing possibilities for them to actually look at. Okay, so I'm going to go past the coding one and take you to the last stop, which is the Z blank. So the Z blank is kind of a collective um, project that was done a few years ago. And it relates to a vinyl toy that they used to sell in Japan. So with the Z blank, 
you're able to print these out and then design on top of them. So this kind of reaches into where you may have that connection with that art teacher or with the reading and language arts teacher or the history teacher. Look at all of the possibilities that can be done with another medium, either the pens or clay or whatever you want to use to adhere to the actual Z block blank. The beauty about this is that this is also found inside Thingiverse. So you're able to go to Thingiverse, you're able to search for it, you're able to print it out large scale, or if you want to, print it out as small as you want to, and have the students design on top of it. If they ruin it, that's okay, because I printed out 50 last night. So now I wouldn't say that to them, because then, <laughs> You're going to end up printing them up. That would be, oh, I see what you did. Oh, yeah, I know that's an issue. I have one more that I can give you, but you got to be very quiet about it. Okay, here you go. So this is something that you may want to consider doing with the students. I encourage you to have them first design 2D on paper what they're about to do. So you can kind of take a look at it, have that conversation with them, and then hand over that Z blank and then have the kids just do what they want creatively. So as mentioned before, if we tie this back to Thingiverse, I search for Z blank and you can see all the different types that people have done. This is the main one. Okay, so on the page itself, it shows you what the model will look like, tells you about the possibilities. And then you would scroll down so that you're underneath the actual photo. And if you sign in and have a direct connection to your 3D printers, like I do, I have a cloud print object here, which means that I can go click on it and send it directly to my printer, okay? So that's the connection that you can start creating for yourself as a teacher is, I bring things in from Z uh, Thingiverse to go ahead and print mass, or it may be that I have the opportunity to go to Tinkercad, choose the option to send to, and if you're lucky, your item will be listed here. If you're not lucky, then I would choose the option to export it as an STL and then send it to the printer that way. You must have a slicing program and that's the one that's currently open. This one is for MakerBot. The slicing program generates a code that tells the printer about the layers about the width and height of the object, of how slow to print, how quick to print. So after you design, it has to go through a slicing program and then go to the actual printer to be printed. Okay. So with that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and kick off printing the object so you can see it in completion. In case you had any questions about how to slice an object inside of a slicing program. So I go and click on the object itself. And then I have controls down here at the very bottom that allow me to move it around or resize it. In this case, I'm going to choose scale and I'm going to take it down to probably about 50%. Now that he's tiny, I want to go ahead and duplicate him and make more. There you go. It's 
So you can put as many as you can on it. Why did you just delete him? Ah, the internet's being slow and difficult. There you go. So you can put as many as you can on the build plate that would fit, as long as it doesn't overhang the actual object or area, because it will not work. Once I have as many as I need, then I go over to the side and decide exactly whether or not it needs supports. And a support is used to fill in a gap or an area that might need support. If you've actually ever printed out an object before and you see the string cheese, it just means that wherever the actual printer went and went over that area, there was nothing there to hold things up. So it just kind of drooped off. If you have built in supports, that means that the area can print even to a 45 or 90 degree angle. And then afterwards, once you take it off the build plate, you would just have to pick off those supports in order to be able to see the object itself. The other item that many people may or may not use is called a raft. Okay. If you choose to use a raft, that means that it, the raft itself will adhere to the build plate and then the object adheres to the raft, giving it stability. So if you have something that has small legs like this one does, you may need to have a raft to hold it on the plate itself because as it's being printed, it's actually being touched and moved and pushed by the actual extruder. And that touch or that push might knock it off center and then it just continues to print, giving you a felt print. So a raft kind of prevents that from happening. I also want to say um, when you're building a, with a raft and you have movable objects, it makes it difficult or you have to be very careful to take off the raft or you're going to break your print. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. So the fact that the object itself might be fragile and having you trying to push and pull might actually snot, snap off legs. It may be a benefit instead to go ahead and have the object lay down so that it's more stable. So let's say, for example, this um, object that we're trying to print right here, if I had a raft and I tried to pull it off, the legs might snap off. So it may be instead of having it stand straight, it may be that I have to go ahead and choose the objects for rotation and rotate the object so it's flat on its back. And that's, uh, okay. It's a Z or a Y axe coordinate and plane. It's green. Okay, so I'm gonna say that you're a 90. And do it. Yay. Okay. Math is awesome. All this relates to math, which is awesome. So what I have here is that he's on his side. I know that the actual area might be more of a mass, but I can tell you that it's, it's sturdier. So if I had a raft and uh, supports, if I decided to go ahead and snap, it's most likely that he won't break apart because it's a bigger um, area that's being covered. Does that make sense? So as you design your objects, you might want to actually lay them down, move them over, tilt them, see whether or not it's a little bit easier for you to remove items without destroying the actual project. Tanya, Jenya, Janet has a question saying, how do you know the thickness that you will need? The thickness? Good question. So when it relates to the actual thickness of the, uh, I guess I should say, many objects that you spend, print out in th uh, 3D printing are comprised of an interior structure 
uh, such that might be honeycomb or it might be lines themselves. There's something that's inside of it that actually gives it that uh, shape. In many of the actual um, programs that you use to slice, you have the ability to make that object thicker or heavier. So instead of just being something that has uh, an infill density of 15, you, you might want to turn your infill density up to 72, which means the object itself will be heavier because there's no spaces or areas or gaps inside. So an object that might be frail or fragile may do better if it has a thicker density so that when you actually take it off of the raft, it's not going to snap because the hollow area inside of it is filled in. If you choose to do that, please remember that the more filament you use, the longer it takes to actually print. So an object that might have taken, I don't know, five hours with a thicker or fill density, it might take five days just depends. So you have to be able to balance that. Uh, for the raft itself, the raft is probably something that's done within the program itself internally. The one that I have at home allows you to go ahead and adjust the thickness of the raft so you don't have to waste filament having a raft printed each and every time. It may be that you want to go in and test to see exactly how much of a raft do you need to give it the ability for that object to adhere to the raft and for the raft to adhere to the actual um, build plate. And then you can kind of go into exactly adjusting the heat. So maybe the actual item is falling off the build plate because it's not hot enough for it to stick to. So you can go in and decide to go in and turn up the actual temperature on the build plate so that it adheres the actual filament, but not to the point where it actually melts it. So when you come back in, it's just a blob because the build plate was too hot. I would say that if you actually do the factory settings for most things, it will succeed. I will also say that the filament that you happen to have, the one that you want to use, read the instructions on the side and it will tell you the actual range for the extruder and also for the build plate. So it will tell you that it can't go over this certain temperature or else it's going to melt and not work for you. It'll be stringy like string cheese. So those items there are some things that you kind of take a look at as you start to print out your objects on your 3D printer. So once these objects are actually fit the way that you need them, on this one right here, you choose the option of Q. And it will go through the slicing process. Uh, we have two printers here. So we need to make sure, and I didn't do that, is that you actually make sure you're sending it to the right printer with the name that it has associated with it. Because this is a online web-based program, I have the possibility to connect to any other printer within our district that connects to um, the MakerBot program online. And I can print from here to the actual um, printer at a different location. So that's the uh, advantage of having that. Can we talk about the shelves and what that does? Oh, yes. So let's see. It's the outermost, outermost layers of the model when printing. So as you take a look at it, and I wish I had a cross section of the actual print, um, but what you'll see is you look down at it, you'll actually see that there is the uh, honeycomb, whatever method you use to fill in the inside, and then you have the outermost layer or shell. So if you want it to be thicker, that means that if I hold it, squeeze it, it's not going to crack like an eggshell. 
And if you choose to up those, once again, you're actually taking that filament and you're doubling it or tripling it, making it, once again, going to take longer for it to print the more that you add or increase it. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. thank you. Sure. So this is trying to actually slice it in order to create that G code. That G code is the item that needs to be sent to the printer, which kind of tells the printer exactly what the expectations are for the object once it's finished. I do want to talk about this. I'm kind of disappointed I didn't have a chance for you guys to go in and do the um, Tinkercad, but I do want to talk about the process of printing only because we need to make sure that when we talk about 3D printing to our kids, that we use the proper terminology to go along with it. And that's whenever you try to do anything that's tech-based, you don't want to make up words. Because that child then goes out into the world and they try to talk about what they've learned with other people who are people who have the knowledge base of it. And then they say something like a squirrely, um, happenstance. What does that mean? My teacher told me it was a squirrely happen. No, it's not. It's this. Uh, oh, okay. Or the parent says, you've done a wonderful thing with 3D printing. I want to buy you a printer. Let's go to Best Buy and do it now. And they go there and they say, I want that thing. And it's a squirrely happen. Give them the terminology, the knowledge, and the foundation to be able to lead when it comes to either purchasing or guiding others to do the same. And that comes with any type of technology we have, devices or such. So when the students go through the process of printing the actual object, you wanna make sure that they understand that the build plate is a plate that's at the very bottom where the object itself is built upon. That's the name build plate. Some are removable, meaning you can take them off and then snap to get the object off of the build plate and then put the build plate on again. Some are not. Some require that you use that little spatula thing and scrape it off and hope that nothing happens. But some printers are built that way. Others are the STL file. Um, so they understand the process of slicing. It may get to the point where you just have your kids print on their own. They've been trained, they know how it goes. You've seen the wonderful things they've developed. It may be that you don't even have to ask them to give you the actual STL. You have a computer that's connected to the printer directly. They just go up, plug in a flash drive or send the file and they print from there. So if you choose to do that with your classroom, then you wanna make sure that they understand what goes beyond or behind it especially when it comes to speed of how they actually slow things down. The slower the actual print, the less lines that you're gonna see because it has time to go ahead and slowly build layer by layer. And of course you wanna actually tell them about the Z, is that finished? Where are you? Okay, still working on it, which means it's going to fail. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, you want to make sure that you tell them about the X, Y, and Z coordinating planes or axis. So that way they understand exactly how to move an object within 3D space, such as tilting it over to the side or raising or lowering it. And all of this is in the presentation. And the last thing is, have a discussion about filament. You have filament that comes along with the printer. That filament is a beginner's filament, similar to what you would expect to have when you first open up. I should be more positive. That filament is a good filament to start with. But as you start to get into your designs and your kids are excited, you can go on to Amazon and pretty much never come back. 
because there's filament with glitter in it and it's fantastic. So consider the different types of filaments. Consider also what we recommend for education is the PLA. PLA because it happens to be corn based. It's not something that's toxic if it heats up. There are others out there like the ABS, which will give a toxic uh, um, odor to it and does require that you have some type of hood to remove that from the area so you don't become sick or ill. But mm -hmm. with PLA, you're pretty much good with it. I know so, we have 10 minutes. To, oh, okay. So there is a slide that tells you about printing. Once again, it's going to mention G code. If you are fortunate, your printers will connect to the internet and then you are able just to go ahead and print from your computer. And mine is still working and that is okay. Mm. If you need to, you probably can go ahead and use a USB drive or some type of SD card and take the actual um, object itself into the slicer and then to the printer because many of the printers that we do have have a slot for the usb drives okay there are resources here for you um, resources dealing with 3d printing um, makerbot specifically um, if you have a different type of printer hopefully if it's associated with an educational program it will have teacher resources for you guys to use. I am going to go to the MakerBot and I'm not doing this because I have a preference. I'm just showing you that if a 3D printing company understands that it's going to be used in the classroom, they usually take the time to make sure that teachers have added advantages, such as producing some type of resource that goes along with the printer to give you those ideals that you need to do inside the classroom with your kids. So MakerBot has a deal where it has two printers and some 3D pens that you can get for a certain amount. I really don't remember the cost of that. Um, but I do know that if you go to Amazon and you type in 3 printing oh, so pretty oh I haven't even told you guys about resin printers maybe it's a different conversation that there are plenty of books that are out there um, this one's a fantastic one that has different um, projects that kids can do uh, this here does require that there's a certain skill level associated with it, but if you as a teacher go through the process of actually building it first, then you're able to get the kids to go ahead and buy into patience, which comes along with understanding things don't happen overnight. I understand that you have the need to build these items, but let's follow these steps here. Let's talk about why we want to make sure that everything lines up correctly. And such and so on. So that's a journey that you guys can take together with the kids. All righty then. That that's pretty much all I have.